Hi everybody, this is Don Dixon. I want to welcome you to our last discussion on the man-made structure. Uh, we've talked about all but a couple of the 17 that we started out to define and uh, what's left is dams, uh, breakwaters, and wing dams. Now, I did uh, touch on fishing dams when we talked about the uh, causeways. I think we started with causeways. And we did mention that fishing a causeway and a dam, pretty much the rocky riprap of, of these structures, would be about the same. However, I want to give you a specific example of fishing a dam and especially in some of these big reservoirs. And I should say, especially when you're talking flatland reservoirs. Some lowlands too, but mainly flatlands. They're so expansive, and, and in most cases, the dams are two, three miles long. And they offer a terrific structure, which you can just go fish. You can see it. You don't need a contour map to, to locate the dam in the reservoir. So. They're just great structures. I want to give you an example of something that happened years and years and years ago in my very beginning apprenticeship with Buck Perry. And I'll tell you a few things about Buck along the way. Uh, this may be not really known. Uh, and that is, he was a perfectionist. He was extremely precise when it came to uh, presentation of lures or interpretation of a structure, uh, your general interpretation of a fishing situation, he was always impeccably precise. And it was his nature. Uh, and sometimes I tend to be a little slovenly <laughs> in most things that I do. Uh, so uh, when he and I were in this mentor apprenticeship uh, relationship, I had to sort of always be minding my P's and Q's. I had to really be working hard at trying to do what it was that he wanted. And he was always teaching. Even though when I didn't realize he was teaching, he was teaching. He'd come up with situations and do things and put me in positions from time to time where he was trying to educate me, but without me knowing it. I know that sounds sort of <laughs> weird, but uh, looking back on almost everything we ever did, I got a different uh, opinion of that situation as I got more and more knowledgeable along the way. But this happened early on, and I'm going to tell you about it because it serves a couple of different purposes. It has to do with fishing a dam, but it also has to do with pre precision in your presentation of lures and some things we're going to be talking about it in our next master class. But I'm going to give you a little bit of an opening to that today. I brought some of my lures along uh, so I can describe to you what Buck had me do. Years and years ago, I had already uh, been on many fishing trips with him and he had told me about uh, the importance of being a skilled troller. He said, most people don't talk about it today. No one teaches it. He said, but if you want to be consistently successful in your fishing, all species, all different lake types, under any and all weather and water conditions, you must do two things mechanically to catch fish, cast and troll both. And he said, of the two, Trolling is way more difficult, or I should say, a skilled troller is way harder to produce than it is a skilled caster. Casting, you can pretty much learn in five minutes. Uh, you can be really good at it probably in two or three days if you practice. I know guys literally that can cast behind their back and hit that coffee cup at 30 yards. It's not that hard to do. You can take a young child, teach them how to cast, and literally in five minutes. It's not that hard, but yet in most of the fishing stuff and the instructions and things you see today, everybody's talking about casting. It's easy. It's simple. So Buck made a point that not only will proper trolling techniques catch you a lot more fish 
in the end uh, wrap up of every fishing day it's also imperative that you learn how to follow brake lines when it comes to your mapping and interpretation which is something we're going to talk about in the following series how to map and interpret the exact spots on structure where the fish will be he said if you don't have the ability to follow brake lines precisely while you're under a motor troll he said you'll never make it he said the separation point between uh, I don't mean this to be sexist, but his comment was always the, the, the separation point between the men and the boys in fishing is mapping and interpretation. His point being simple, whether you're male or female, the real separation between a great fisherman, a really good fisherman, and somebody that just catches some fish every now and then is mapping and interpretation. Now, that being said, he had this idea that he was going to make sure that I had developed that skill if I was going to, after all, be running his schools and so on and so forth. He had to be sure that he was going to develop early on, he was going to develop, in my mind, the importance of being a good troller. And all the other stuff will take care of itself as far as the mechanics of fishing. So that brings me to today's story about a dam. He had this favorite reservoir out in Mississippi called Grenada. I think maybe I mentioned it once before. And uh, he, had, he had discovered this reservoir uh, and had fished it during an early fall situation for the first time. And they were starting to draw down the reservoir at that time. Uh, and it was being drawn down for the winter pool. Well, he caught a bunch of fish uh, on that trip, so it became a, a bit of a favorite little spot for him, and he thought it'd be a good idea to sometime go out there when it was really pulled down all of the way, because he had heard that they pulled the lake down some 30 to 35 feet, and he thought it'd be interesting to be able to visually see some of the structures uh, late fall, early winter, that were out of water uh, that are normally underneath water. So he had the idea of going out there in late fall. So he went out there with a fishing buddy before I came on the scene, long before I uh, had met Buck. And they went in the late fall. It was November. It was cold. And he was telling me about it. And he said, Don, those big old bass, I mean the big fish, you know, a bunch of four, five, six pound fish were just stacked on this dam. Uh, they were in shallow and of course in the fall months we get shallow movements of fish because of the stability of the weather at that time of year again that's another subject we'll talk about later but he said they were stacked in there he said it was unbelievable how many big fish they caught shallow fishing this dam he said someday I'll take you out there well it was about I guess I'd been with them maybe a year year and a half something like that and I had learned my trolling information and my trolling techniques. I, he had taught me all this stuff. But this particular trip was a little bit different. He had this in his mind that this is what he was going to do. And he was going to take me to Grenada Reservoir out in Mississippi. So off we went. And it was just me and Buck. And we get out there and he showed me this beautiful long dam stretching out there. I don't know, it's three, four miles long. And it gorgeous, and we were out there in the late fall, and they had pulled this reservoir down. And his experience, of course, was he was catching all these big fish out there at that time of year. So he said, now here's what we're going to do. He said, you're going to take me fishing. Now we had planned on just spending the weekend there. It was a Saturday and Sunday. There wasn't nobody there. Nobody's fishing. Shoot, it was hunting season. You know, most of the sportsmen are out hunting. Uh, but we're the only ones on the lake. And he said, here's what I want to do. He said, I want you to take me fishing. He said, but I want to stay on this dam and I want to stay on it for two days. We're not going to leave this dam. We're going to only fish this structure. He said, but I want you to be driving the boat. He said, I'm not even going to give you a little break. You're going to drive the boat for the two, whole two days. And he said, 
I want to make sure that you're developing this skill of being a troller, a real troller, someone that can keep that boat Maneuver that boat in such a way that the lure is always in the exact position that it's meant to be in. He said, so you're going to be taking me fishing for two days. We're never going to leave here. He said, but I'm going to handicap you a little bit. Here came, here came, here came the, the little oops. He said, I'm not going to allow you to turn your depth sounder on. He said, I want you to fish and feel the lures on the bottom of the lake and I want you to control your boat in a fashion that is feeling the bottom of the lake only no depth sounder and I said well we going fishing and that's a common way we used to troll the shallows he used to refer to that as just contour trolling. When you're trolling eight to ten feet or less, you're just feeling the, you know, feeling the bottom, bumping and free running, bump, free run. But to fish there for two days without a depth sounder, I mean, I, I didn't understand what he was trying to do. But I said, okay, because you know, you never argued with the boss. Whatever he wanted, that's what you did. And you're always trying to please him. I mean, I was always trying to be his guy, you know, be that guy he could be proud of and and uh, so on and so forth. So he said, okay, no depth sound. And this is what he was wanting me to do, nothing different than we already had been doing for two years. Uh, when it comes to fishing uh, the eight to 10 feet or less, we've got three lures, 500 spoon plug, which goes two to four feet, 400 spoon plug goes four to six, and this 250 goes six to nine feet. Now that's shallow water. And in order to strain all the water normally, if we're fishing a structure that's that's a, like this particular structure, it's three miles long, we don't want to start by casting. We'll be there for two weeks trying to cast that up. But we can troll it in a half hour. We can go down through there. But to check all of these depths of the first three size lures, normally we would do this contour trolling. And here's how it works. And I'm going to give you this little bit because it Today's story is not so much about the lures, but we'll be doing a lot of that in the next series coming up, Mechanics of Fishing. But for the purpose of this example today, let me tell you. This lure runs two to four feet. We want to jam this in close. If you remember the Jack Arisman story, which ended up with tens of thousands of people, where he caught the first five pounder on a 500. That's this lure right here. It's traveling two to four feet depending on line length. Well, when we're checking the shallows on this long dam, I want this lure to always be in into two to three foot. I want to jam it in there close. And when I have a, if I'm running on the inside, which I was as we started this process, Buck had a 400 on, which is on the outside of the boat, and he's running this lure, which runs four to six feet. So we're straining, if you can imagine. You know, we've got a brace of lures out there. He's off this side of the boat. I'm off this side, and we're trolling. And we're covering basically two to six feet of water with these two lures. Now, the way it's done is we will angle the boat in until this lure, I'm on the inside now, until my little 500 started to tick the rocks, the rocky riprap. As soon as it made contact with the bottom of the reservoir, and hit those rocks, I know that it's running at the depth that I want it to run. And at that time, the next maneuver is to slowly control the boat and maneuver the boat out towards deeper water. Now the key is not to turn the boat out, but to just angle the boat out until you feel that lure start to free run. And it's no longer ticking the rocks. And then you angle, slowly angle that boat back in towards the shallower water until you feel it start to tick again. Once it starts ticking, you angle the boat out until it starts to free run, you angle it back in. It's called contour trolling. That's what we call contour trolling. Now, it wasn't anything new to me at that point. However, Buck said, look, here's the deal. I want to run the entire length of this dam. And we're keeping these lures in position, he said, but your lure, the shallowest running lure here, is the feed lure. Don't worry about what my lure is doing. You just worry about this lure right here. 
the shallowest one, the closest one to the rocks. It starts ticking. You angle that boat out. When it runs free, I want you to angle back in, and I want that maneuver to be instant. I don't want you to turn sharp, but I want it to be instant. As soon as it free runs, you angle back in till you feel it tick. Once it ticks, you instantly angle back out until it free runs. And I want you to keep that up for three and a half or four miles, well, however long it was. It's a long distance. Now, here's what I want you to get. Put yourself in my position now. I'm trying to, I'm trying to please the greatest fisherman who ever lived. I'm trying to not make a mistake with the guy who wrote the book, who made all the discoveries, who's known as the father of modern day fishing. I'm trying to make no mistakes and we're just getting started and I'm gonna to have to do this for two days. And what he told me was, we're not just gonna contour troll, I want, we, I want to fish the entire structure till we've gone as deep as we can go. Now with dams, they have a base break line where sooner or later those rocks end. And that is the base break line. We have to fish it all the way down to that depth. He says, but in this case, normally we would turn the depth sounder on once we passed up, passed over these first three lures. Once we're in deep water, we'd have the depth sounder on. Looking to follow a break line. No, we're not going to do that. He said, I want you to feel everything. And I want you to keep your boat in position so that our lures are in position because in the end, he said, I want to catch fish. And I'm relying on you to make sure that happens. Now, he's saying it with sort of a smile on his face, but I'm going like, gee whiz, man. Okay, I'm under the gun, I'm under pressure. But, like someone once said, anybody who likes to compete, I like pressure. But in this case, you know, I've got this genius in the front of the boat. I don't really need to have all this pressure. I'd much rather be sitting up there and let him drive the boat. And, and go out there and catch a bunch of fish. But that wasn't going to happen. He was determined that he was going to make a real troller out of me in two days. Well, because I was so incredibly zeroed in on not making a mistake, I was like my old Irish setter when she was setting a pheasant or like a pointer, <laughs> pointing a, you know, a covey of quail. I was just on point like the whole time. There was no relief of the pressure that was on me to keep those lures just right. Now about the time we got about halfway down that dam, I think we had caught 10 or 12 fish. We caught a bunch of fish. And then, so we just throw them, throw them back and then we go back to throwing again. And I thought, well, gee whiz, this is going, this is going great. You know, no big deal. But I, I was still in the back of my mind wondering about how, how could we do this for two days nonstop. I'd be pretty worn out. At least mentally I'd be worn out. But at any rate, we kept going. And he kept saying that the lead lure here is going to be the inside lure. He said, don't worry about his lure. Just worry about mine. Tick, tick, free run, tick, free run, tick. For four miles. Get down to the end. We turned around and he hit me with another little handicap. He said, now we're going to go back the other direction. And he said, you're going to be running a 250. And he said, I'll run this 400 on the inside. We're going to strain this water. He said, but now going this direction, I'm on the inside, you're on the outside. He said, but normally you would feed off of your lure, but I don't want you to do that. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> he said, I want you to maneuver this boat based on what you see my Lord doing by watching my rod tip. I said, huh? <laughs> what? Now I can't even feel I've got to watch your... And of course, if you've never run spoon plugs before, I know many of you watching, you know, these videos have been running spoon plugs. But if you haven't, when they're free running, they're running in open water, they just tight wiggle like that. They're moving, especially these shallow running baits. And then as soon as it starts to hit the bottom you, you can feel it ticking and you can see it in the rod tip the rod tip making sort of those kind of maneuvers but when it's free running that rod tip just uh, just about like that 
So now he wants me to make this contour and pass four miles that direction by watching his rod tip. Well, I knew that wasn't going to be easy. <laughs> but again, I'm like that. I'm like that. I reset her boy. I'm, I'm on point here. Let's go. And I start watching his rod tip. And the key in all of this physical, mechanical maneuvering is to keep your boat in a position that keeps your lure in a position that's desired. And what's desired, <coughs> the lure in position, what's desired is if this lure is meant to run at four or five feet of water, whichever you're running four feet, if you're running at the shallowest depth, that means you need to keep it in four feet of water. If it's in seven feet, you're out of position. If it's in two feet, you're out of position. It's in position when you're in four feet. So, I'm doing that by watching his rod tip. And by the time we got back up the other side, I think we had caught, I'm just guessing, we had caught 15, 18 fish. We had, we had caught a bunch of fish. I wasn't counting. All I could think of was keeping that boat in position. And I can tell you the real key to it, and there'll be more on this later, but the real key is to don't over control the boat. Most people that start trolling and haven't trolled in, uh, ever in their in the past in their fishing, they tend to over control the boat and they start zigzagging it like that and the lure starts swinging in and out and it's almost always out of position. So the key is to just angle the boat, angle it in, angle it out, so your lure is never more than that far off the money. So that's what we were doing and now all of a sudden we get to the end of these three lures now we've got to go at 200 and a 100. Now we're down 12 feet, 15 feet, but I've got to do it all by feel. So here we go again. Down four miles, turn around, come back four miles, and we're switching sides, and on the way back, i got to watch his lure to make my determination what to do with the boat. It wasn't easy. But it was going good because the fish were in there. We were catching fish. So, when we got to the end of the second run, or the second run down when we were finished with the 100, he said, now we've got to work deeper because you always got to work base break line on these dams. Well, I knew that. Intellectually, I knew that, but I had never done it without a depth sounder. Keep in mind, I'm still relatively new and it, in Buck's world, in Buck's information, which took him, at that point, he had developed and proven and so on and so forth over 40 years. I'm basically a newcomer. I don't know all this stuff, but intellectually I knew it. I had, I had read it, but I hadn't fished this base break line on the dam by feel. Okay, we had a little short break there, which wasn't scheduled, but the next door neighbor was had his lawn guys over there doing the lawn for the last 20 minutes. So we're going to restart my story. Uh, but after we had made that second pass, I, I, I guess it was obvious to Buck. I was a little bit worn out mentally, trying to be exact and all of that. So he stopped and we just sat there and talked for a minute. And he said, you know, I can see where this is sort of working on you a little bit. He said, but it's necessary. He said, you've got to develop that feel. It's just as important is almost anything else that we could talk about. Feeling the lure on the bottom of the lake, staying in contact, and keeping that lure in the designed depth it's supposed to be running. It's important. He said, in catching fish, it's extremely important that your lure is in position on the troll. He said, but in your subsequent mapping of structure, if you don't have the ability to follow that break line exactly, You'll never get the true size and shape of the structure. It's the break lines that are forming the structure. And you just we just had this big, long study about structure. Uh, so when Buck was telling me, he said, in your map and interpretation, it's critical. This skill that you have to develop. So he said, I'm telling you this, but I also want to remind you, you think you're having it tough right now. We've only been here a couple of hours. He said, when I developed all of my theories back in the day. He said, I, inv I realized I needed a lure that would go to different depths so I could start to confirm my theories 
and turn them from theory into fact. But there were no depth sounders back in those days. I didn't invent the first depth sounder, he said, until quite a few years later. He said, but in 1946, I developed these lures. And he said, all of my discoveries I made by feeling the bottom of the lake. And, you know, I never really knew that. I don't think he'd ever mentioned it before. And now his discoveries boggle my mind even more. I couldn't believe that. Oh, yeah, that's right. Back when you made these discoveries and told the fishing world all about the deep water tendencies of a fish and how they utilize bottom features when they move about in the lake, you did that all by feel. No depth sounders. <laughs> and now I was even more amazed at everything he said in done and all of his contributions to the sport most of it was formulated all by feeling the bottom of the lake